Today's episode of the Believe in Steelers show brought to you by betonline.ag. They'll take care of all of your gambling needs this football season into the divisional round of the playoffs. Ike, here's what you need to do. Head to betonline.ag. Use our promo code BELIEVE. That's B-L-E-A-V. You can see it on your screen right now. You'll receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. Welcome to the Believe in Steelers show on the Believe Network. I'm your host, Mark Bergen, joined as always by my guy, Pittsburgh Steelers scout, two-time Super Bowl champion, and 12-year veteran of the team, number 24, Ike Taylor. IT, I am very excited about today's guest. Yeah, we got somebody on today's show, uh, which I've been around for a long time, which he is on Pittsburgh Phillips, and amongst all other stuff he has. So uh, no further notice, we got to let everybody know that Craig Wolfley will be on the show today, our special guest, Mr. Craig. Man, it is so good to see your beautiful face, Ike. I mean, you're just you're looking you're looking sharp, dude. You're looking sharp. Now I gotta <laughs> ask you both, okay? I, I was I was either third in my sixth grade spelling beer, or I was sixth in my third grade. But believe is not spelled that way, right? <laughs> right I'm, I'm just saying, just saying. That's all. I just I just want to put it out there. All right, Ike, you want to take this one? Hey. Yeah, Craig, it's a it's a different it's a different generation, Craig. You know, these kids they spell things a little bit differently now. So that's what we got to work with. But Craig, um, you've been working with the Pittsburgh Steelers for a long time, born in Buffalo, New York. Uh, wind up going to the university which you represent Syracuse and wind up playing guard in the NFL, fifth round from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, just in your mind and how you thinking right now, what's different from the way you play? I play and now this generation when it comes down to the NFL football? You know, you're getting to it just like you did as a player. Come straight ahead, going to be physical, and there ain't going to be no monkeying around. Uh, we get right to it. You know, it's different. It's a different generation. I mean, I come from, you know, and you, you did too, the two practices a day, training camp, you know, that kind of rough and everything else. It was life. That's the way it was. And, um, you know, Football was a little bit different. Back then, it was um, you didn't have 147 camera angles to uh, try to, you know, officiate every single conflict that was uh, arising out on the field. And um, you handled things in an old school way. There was things like vigilanteism, frontier justice, and, you know, guys going out there to protect their teammates. And there was a little bit of, uh, there was a lot of, let's just say there was a lot of, of violence back then. But, you know, that's what kind of drew us to the, this game, did it not, Ike? There's a lot of parallels between both you and Ike in terms of your playing careers, 12-year careers in the league, respectively, between both of you. What I wanted to ask you is Ike tells me all the time when he was a rookie coming into the league in 2003, Deshae Townsend took him under his wing. Deshae even gave Ike the keys to a truck and says, hey, you can have this for your full rookie season. Who was that player when you were coming into the league in the 80s that took you under uh, that took you under his wing when you were coming up? Oh, man, that was John Kolb. That was Sam Davis. That was Larry Brown. All these guys, Mike Webster, legends. You know, I mean, these were the building blocks of the 70s Super Bowl Steelers. And the fact is, when you, you know, you get with these guys, um, it was just like you said. I remember Sam Davis. He was thinking about selling this car, but say, hey, here, take it for a ride. You know, hey, Rook, you know, boom. And it was just, it was that sort of locker room. It was that same sort of locker room that I believe that Ike inherited as we went. There's a culture of, of accountability as a teammate, a culture of winning, a culture of leadership. Um, there's, it's all inherent in the Steeler organization. And it's all about the locker room because that locker room was, absolute key and foundation to the great teams that emanated from the seventies on. Um, I, I was listening to some interviews you did as well, Craig. Um, there was one where you were like battling a skunk in training camp. I need the story behind this. Oh, it's unbelievable, right? We're in this deluge and we're hanging out by the, the one building up there on campus. Okay. And I want to go get a car. I want to get my car, go home, you know? But as I'm making my way, as the rain started to let up, I'm crossing where the softball fields are, and Ike knows where I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, I'm confronted by a skunk. The skunk is standing right in the middle of the sidewalk, and the thing is looking at me, and it's got those the evil, I'm going to about to skunkinate you with a little, uh, some bad odorific stuff here if you don't get out of my way. So I'm backing up, 
and the skunk, he follows me. Then I walk towards it a couple. It, it backs up. I go to my left. It follow, It's like doing mirror dodge with me. I'm going, great googly moogly. Are you kidding me? Now, all the while this is going on, my compadres of the media, right? They're all hanging out oh, under no. the overhang from the building about 40 yards away. Okay, so they're safely ensconced from the skunk. Okay, there's no confrontation there. They're staying out of the rain. I'm going to get the car so I can drive back, pick these guys up who are now laughing at me because I'm being backed down by a skunk right in the middle of the campus, man. It was unbelievable. Was you that know, this past season, Craig? Leave. What's that? Was that this past year? That was this past year. Of all <laughs> things, having a skunk back you down, man, it was, it was humbling. I know that's like your initiation decades later. I know you've been part of the Steelers organization so long, both as a player and a broadcaster, an initiation of sorts. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't even know how to quantify that. How do you get into a a, a mirror dodge situation with a skunk? I mean, that's just to me, I don't, that's over and above uh, bullying. That's over and above any sort of, you know, uh, stuff that you got to do. You know, the skunk was bullying me for crying out loud. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Another thing I wanted to ask you about Craig is when you're coming into the league, did you have a moment that was your welcome to the NFL moment where it's just like, welcome aboard. Here's what it's like to either be a rookie or a young player in the league. And this isn't college anymore. Oh, there were so many of them. I mean, you know, I can remember all different sorts of uh, times when, you know, got confronted, you might play. Well, I remember the first time I went to mano a mano with Joe Green in training camp. Well, I almost had a heart attack, you know what I mean? Because he was such a legendary figure. Mm-hmm. You know, it starts with you were there a week ahead of time. Back then, they would bring you in one week ahead of the veterans for doubles. So you're sitting there, you go through a whole week of, of, of doubles with the, the rookies and first, second year players. And then all of a sudden, there you are, and you're in the, the dining hall up at St. Vincent College. And Let's in roll. walks Terry Bradshaw, Joe Green, John Stallworth, Donnie Shell, Mel Blunt, Jack Lamb. I'm, you're ripping off legends. Mike, Mike Webster. I'm Mike Webster had arms like legs and legs like people. Okay. And they, <laughs> they just come rolling in. And, and I'm sitting there with my buddy, Tun Jilkin. And I'm thinking to myself, what are we doing here? They don't need us. <laughs> they just won the fourth of their Super Bowls in, in the 70s, four out of six years. It was just tremendous, you know, to be able to be amongst them. But I remember a Tunch got cut for like a few weeks of our rookie year. And he said, you know, I'm not leaving here empty hand. I'm going to go get some autographs. <laughs> You have the gift of Gab. Where did you develop that, Craig? Um, you know, I, I think that um, a fine Syracuse edu- education cross-inated with um, about a dozen concussions, and they kind of work together. <laughs> well, listen, I'm going to argue that my alma mater, the University of Missouri, is better than Syracuse. I will <laughs> die on that hill, but I hope you don't hold that against me. I do not at all, man. You know, I mean, that's the way it is. You know, you stand up for where you've been. Absolutely. So you've been in your post-playing career, part of Steelers broadcast since 2002, and you've been partnered with Bill Hillgrove, the legend. When your friends and family ask you your favorite Bill Hillgrove story, what's the story that you tell? Oh, man. Chilly Billy. There's there's so many. Um, You know, it's to isolate one. Well, okay, Super Bowl 40. Um, so there we go. We're in Detroit and Billy says, you know what? We need to call Myron. If you remember Myron Cope, of course, Myron Mm -hmm. was a great broadcaster. Um, so well-known famous. He was in the booth for 30 some years. Uh, so he had just retired and then we go to Super Bowl 40 in Detroit. So Billy says, why don't we call Cope up and let's see what he's got to say. So Myron gets on there and he says, Billy, how you doing? Because he had that squeaky high voice, you know, the Myron coach. You know, it's just always all about the squeakiness. So he says, he, he says, Billy, have a good call, blah, blah, blah. Tunch talks to him, right? So then Billy hands me the phone. And I think, why is it, you know, I, I'm just a sideline guy. And he hands it to me. And I, I love Myron. He's always been so such a great guy to me, right? So I says, Myron, what's up? And he goes, well, Flea. Don't say anything stupid. Ah, what's the point? You will anyhow. So it's Cope 
Pilgro, those two, they were such a big part of my broadcasting career. Ike, do we finally have you back? I know you've had some signal issues. Yeah, I, I had had to leave. I had to leave. I had to come outside. I had to come outside. There you are. You're looking better in 10 movie stars, Ike. No, so... <laughs> I don't know about that. I appreciate that. Just from hearing what I could hear, Wolf, you played with a lot of greats. You played with some Hall of Famers. Um, what kept you in the game or what you thought kept you in the game for that long, playing alongside of them greats and them Hall of Famers? You know, it's like I've always said, I wasn't great. I was a guy, right? But God gave me the desire of my heart. When I was seven years old, I told my mom on the QT, I said, Mom, I'm going to be a pro football player someday. And God gave me that desire, uh, gave me that that resolution to it. And I found myself with the Steelers. And I I was amongst the greats, man. I know what it's like to be in the huddle with greatness because I've seen it up close with Bradshaw, Franco Harris, all these guys, you know. I know what it's like to share a locker room with guys like Joe Green and and L.C. Greenwood and Dwight White and Jack Lambert. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So I was so fortunate. I was so blessed to be able to come along and spend 12 of the best years of my life in the NFL. And the, the whole thing was I loved the game. I just loved the game. I know that when I first arrived, it's kind of like if they had just paid me like McDonald's coupons and paid my rent, I'd have played for free. I mean, that's just how much I love the game, man. I come from, a, you know, a small uh, brethren church, right? And, you know, the thing about it was we always taught to turn the other cheek in that. Well, you know what? As a young man, you got a lot of yayas, you know, and you got to get those out. My my outlet was playing football, man. It was just so much fun because the things you do on a set Friday night or Saturday or Sunday, depending on where you are, uh, would get you in trouble the rest of the week, you know, if you were doing those things out on the street. So that was my outlet. That's what I loved about the game. I'm sure you did too in that sense of, with football, it's that physical confrontation, man. There's just no replacing it. Well, what what was uh what, what was the biggest difference in your mind between the two organizations? Because you played for the Pittsburgh Steelers mm. alongside with the Minnesota Vikings. Were there any kind yep. of comparison? What was the difference? You know what it was? It was the Roonies. It was the Roonies made a difference. When I landed in Minnesota after 10 years in Pittsburgh, went to Minnesota, they had like seven different owners. And it was just, it was a, it's a great organization. It just was not the Steelers. It did give me the opportunity to experience outside Steelers Nation and the Pittsburgh Steelers themselves. And it was wonderful. But it's really all about the personal relationship that started with meeting the chief way back in the day, the founder, Art Rooney Sr., his son, DMR, you know, and what Mr. Rooney meant to so many of us is you had a special relationship with DMR. And I know how much he loved you. And, um, you know, in, in, in today with Art, Art the second, um, it's it's special. It's a as much as it's a huge business, um, it's still got that family mm -hmm. feel that you just love. Agree. Um, I call Troy Palomalo my brother. Um, it, it's, it's, it's so close that I put him in um, my will. If something was to happen to my mom, his mom, um, I would, I would like if something was to happen to me, Ivan's mom, or his mom, or my mom. Troy would be next in line to take care of my son. That's how much um, I care, mm. love Troy. And the reason why I'm saying was the brotherhood between you and Touch. Yes. Wherever you've seen Craig, you've seen, you've seen Touch, you've seen Craig. We like to call each other brothers from another place. Exactly. Today. How close was y'all? When did it start? You know, it started, uh, we were drafted together, uh, you know, in 1980. Uh, as I always remind the Tunch, I was the fifth rounder and he was just a sixth rounder. Okay, so <laughs> we started from that. But really, you know, from the time that we roomed together and I met this crazy Turk, I couldn't believe it because you know what St. Vincent bedrooms are like you know i mean it's block walls at that time there was no air conditioning back in my day right and so i'm sleeping in this room and this guy in the middle of the night the very first night we're there he sits up in bed and he starts speaking in turkish in his sleep 
Now, I don't know anything about Turkey. I don't know anything about speaking Turkish. All I know is this dude that I do not know sat bolt upright in bed and started going, like this. And then he laid right back down. I was like, whoa, what just happened? What is this guy doing, man? It freaked me out, right? But from there on, we became brothers. And, uh, you know, it's funny because as you feel about Troy, so I was with Tunch. And we know that uh, our brother Tunch has, has, has passed. He's with Jesus now. He's in good, great shape. But, you know, he's got uh, he's got kids and he's got his mom. And uh, that's something that my wife and I, we take very seriously. And we check in with them and we're doing what we need to do to take care of Mama I-10, which is uh, Tunch's mom. So, uh, you know, that brotherhood, that blood, sweat and tears that you spoke of with Troy, that's what it is. It's It's all about that connection you make and that brotherhood that carries you beyond your football years. I guess we did have something in common. That's coming in together. Uh, you and Touch came in together in 1980. Troy and I came in together in 2003. And like you said, it's, it's just that brother from another mother kind of atmosphere. Um, you, you, you've been around. Um, and I, I'm sure coming from the 80s and how you're talking and how close and how good and how accountable we held each other in locker room in the 80s. We did the same thing in the early thousands. So I'm sure that put a smile in your heart as well. Like, okay, we finally got this kind of group back. Um, you was a part of our championship runs. You was a part of the, the, the training camps. Actually, I sat with y'all over some fire in training camps between you and the front office guys and the equipment guys and, and yes. then the pre So it's always, it's always like family. I mean, I mean, you hit it on the head when it came down to the Rooney's. Um, the, in the way that Pittsburgh still is pretty much running the whole organization, um, it's, it's players first. It's players first. And, and it, not only do they show that, they show it over countless years. And there's a reason why, you know, Pittsburgh always been successful. So you and I always got a brotherhood, one that you were drafted by the Pittsburgh still as you started before me. Um, you've been through the trenches. And what I tell people, uh, football ain't football without offensive defense alignment. And I tell my kids, the kids that I coach, uh, all these skilled kids who are on the outside of the box, hey, man, we're nothing without the offensive and defensive line because them boys don't have plays off. They got to bang every day. And it's a brotherhood on that offensive line. I'm sure that speaking of their brotherhood with offensive line, Pittsburgh wind up starting bad between the offensive line this year, but they wind up gelling and having the only offensive line that played the most snaps and played together this year. Your thoughts on that with the Pittsburgh Steelers offensive line on how they started and how they ended for the season? Exactly. So, and before I go one further, though, I got to give you an illustration because what you hit on that family, Ike. Now you remember Tunch and I always, they, they always stuck us in the very back end of the plane. Cause you know, all the guys up front, you know, you guys were all the highfalutin guys, me and Tunch were in convict row. I mean, we're as far back as you can go in the plane, except that we'd be on the tail wing, uh, you know, if, if we went any further back. So we're sitting back there and after a game, you know, it's you guys, I'm looking at Casey Hampton, you know, walking around, James Ferrier. I look over, I see you, I see Deshay, and you guys coming around. And Tunch leans over and goes, watch these guys. And we're sitting there looking at, looking at you guys all hanging around each other post-game, you know, and, and on the plane and, and talking, you know, as we're flying along. And he goes, you know why these guys are so good? He goes, look, they love each other. I mean, there is such a camaraderie that is so self-evident to even us guys sitting outside the, the bubble of the team watching you guys interact with each other. And that was, to me, the secret and the core of the 70s guys, the, the 2000s guys, all the success, because it is so familial. It's about family. It's about, I you know, watching you. I, I laugh because I have these memories of you. I believe we were in Arizona. And you were doing a dance off at the end of the game on the sidelines. Now I was a sideline guy at that time. Do you remember that? You're looking across at somebody. I can't remember yeah. who was on the other side. Was it Deshay or was it somebody else? But you're doing a dance move the last minute of the game. You're just you're just sinking down, going up down, and somebody's doing it on the other side. And I'm laughing. I'm going. It, it, it's connected even when they're not together. Yeah, that's the. I mean, I mean, Wolf, you you hitting it. On the head. That's why I like to ask some of y'all, still the greats who played before us, like, what did y'all see in the early 2000s when we played? But it, like you say, I always start with the Rooney family. I felt like it was just a brotherhood. Like, it hurted me to give up a play because I know yeah. I had to walk back in that huddle 
to the rest of the guys. And you know what? It hurted me internally, but it helped me because they'll look at me and be like, man, let that play go. We need you on the next play. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when we get this short-term memory. And for, for you as well, and, and, and Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, you, it, it kind of – Oh. Well, we will get Ike back in just a second here, Craig. I do have a question, and we do want to get your thoughts about the line as well. Right. But I read a book about the 70s Steelers that talked about the sauna at Three River Stadium. <laughs> Did that continue on even into the 80s in terms of that brotherhood and that camaraderie and that connection that you had with your teammates? There's no doubt about it. Of course, you know the sauna. And if it's a story, I'm, one of the stories I'm thinking of, the sauna at Three Rivers Stadium, they would shut down the, the day before the game. And what they do is post-game, you'd have some adult beverages and a large mm-hmm. garbage can. And so we would ensconce our way into the sauna at post-game when all the media guys are outside in the locker room. And we'll be sitting in the sauna indulging in uh, a little liquid refreshment, shall we say. So... Um, one of the uh, sometimes we'd have some visitors from the opposite team. They would come in and uh, sit down in the sauna, uh, and one of them happened to be a gentleman from the Kansas City Chiefs. He was a center who shall go unnamed. Um, came in and imbibed on a few, and son of a gun, when he went back out there, all the buses had left. <laughs> <laughs> he missed the plane back to Kansas City, and uh, so he stayed over with the uh, the guy he was playing against, Gary Dunn, the nose tackle, all day. And, uh, you know, that's, that was business back then. You know, it was a little bit different. Them, them, them was the good old days. Um, I saw a picture uh, of the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, I want to say in the 60s or 50s, where he got a whole Marlboro in his hand at halftime. Like Dawson. His, yeah. Um, his yeah. So you already know. You already know, Mark. So it was a little bit different back in the days, man. It was a little uh, fun and relaxed back in the day so um i experienced not them kind of moments but you know we 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 had some good times as well on the plane rides coming from uh the wins that we had especially the playoffs but uh yeah wolf also a lot of people don't know uh, craig wolfley is a black belt in jujitsu craig wolfley came in fifth place in the strong man competition and Craig Wolfley was it first or second place in a sumo competition? Am I right? Okay, that's really a bad visual. Like, let's not go. <laughs> Wearing a giant diaper is not really very cool. <laughs> it's. I got to tell you, man, that was. I love competition. Okay, I mean, when I was growing up, I'm 64 now. My competitions are like, how much sleep can I get tonight? That's that's really what it's about for me now. But when I was you know, a younger man. I, I love comp- competing. You know, whether it was the NFL strongman, the world's strongest man, it was um, boxing. I did a little bit of that, you know, um, which I was really good at eating punches. <laughs> but, you know, sumo, and I love to compete. Whatever the competition was, I wanted to test myself. So, yeah, I did, I did a lot of that. It's a little bit crazy. Nowadays, you can't think of the fact that you would engage like the world's strongest man was a contest over five, five straight days, Monday through Friday, two events a day, 10 events. And it was like three weeks out from training camp. And I'm sitting there going, should I do this even? And, you know, and, but then you said, okay, you want to go out and compete? And I wanted to compete. And the fact is I, I stopped running like a month before the contest and then training camp was just three weeks after. And you talk about, woo, have to get, like, running fast. Woo. Man, that was a killer switching over from a power-based objective, going to the world's strongest man, and then going to training camp a mere three weeks later. That took a lot of running and was a lot of pain. But that's that was me. I just I enjoyed the, the athletic competition. So, Wolf. Uh, you're working with Max Starks now, yes. correct? For the for the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, what's what's the difference between Touch R.I.P. Touch, Dead Soul in Heaven, and Max um, when y'all doing games live for the Pittsburgh Steelers? You know what's funny, Ike, is you take a look at Max. First of all, Touch was a Pro Bowler, you know, offensive tackle, six two. His greatest weight was two sixty five. 
Then you got Max, six foot eight, 340 some pounds. <laughs> you know, when I first interviewed Max, when he was a player and I wound up the end of it, I said, and by the way, this is what it looks like in different eras. And I stood in front of Max. Max is looking down at the top of my head when he was during his playing career. He's looking down and I, and I said to everybody, I "Go, we at one time played the same position. <laughs> You know, as I'm standing in front of Max, and I'm so much shorter and smaller than yeah. he is. And that's the way it was with Tunch, too. But the thing about Tunch, Tunch had great hands. He he really pioneered the power punch that is taught so much in the uh, offseason and during football. But his hands were so great. Think about this, if you will. He played the great Reggie White. And we all know who the Minister of Defense Reggie White is, okay? Reggie White, he played him six times. Six times. And he never gave up a sack to Reggie once. That's amazing. That's an amazing factoid right there. Um, and going back to Max, uh, he's dynamic. He's awesome. I love the guy. The guy is, matter of fact, I know Tunch loved him too. You know, and you know, of course, and you know Max very, very well. He's just a great young man who um, speaks so well, communicates so well. He's just a really smart guy. And he was a, Excellent player and uh, got nothing but all the respect and love in the world for Max Starks. I have a lot of fun with him. He's a great guy. Craig, keeping it in the new school, what areas do you think that the Steelers need to approve on in 2023? You can take this in any direction. I know we did ask you about the line earlier, but go ahead and take off just based on your observations from this past season. And this is, you have to understand, I maybe suffer from ramnesia, so I go off on tangents. So feel free to reel me in at any time. I got you. Speaking of the offensive line, um, that's a group that, that came together. You know, pre-buy, post-buy, the Steelers were two and six pre, seven and two after. But the last four games, they rushed for, they averaged rushing 150 yards a, a game over the last four games. They were they, six out of the last seven games. They rushed over a hundred yards. I mean, the line just came together beautifully and that's just, it takes time with a line, especially today when, you know, they got all the duos that, you know, the double teams and so forth. And you got run throughs all the time and you've got to be prepared. One guy leaves, one takes over that sort of thing. All the zone blocking concepts that were different than in my day. Um, but the line came together beautifully. So, and uh, what was the other question that I'm sorry that you, you did? No, no. I, I was just saying what areas you, you oh, think that the Steelers need yes. to improve on most in this upcoming season, considering it was kind of like the tale of two seasons in 2022. Absolutely. Explosive plays. Mm -hmm. They were near the bottom in, in lacking of explosive plays. Those chunk plays, Ike knows that can derail a good defense. You know, I mean, those the ability for um, – for uh, a, a, an offense to be able to go 15, 30 plays here and there. So you're not plotting your way down the field, which can tire a defense out and so forth. But the fact is explosive plays that kind of, you know, it, it just, it gets you to the goal faster, you know, and it makes you more explosive teams have to back off. So those are the big plays that I think with Kenny, Kenny Pickett, just mm -hmm. dynamite guy, young man with mobility. He's got arm strength and he's just, He's got that captain cool thing. Whatever he needs to get done under pressure, the kid, pressure doesn't bother him. I was really, really pleasantly surprised to see how well he operated in those, you know, short time frames running the two minute offense and everything. Yep. And it didn't always show up in the stat sheet, but what we noticed was what the game dictated in just making smart, intelligent plays that might not show up on a stat sheet, but is the difference between winning and losing in the NFL. Oftentimes it's marginal. Exactly so. And a lot of it had to do with, I believe, in his first five games, Kenny threw eight interceptions. And over yep. his last eight games, he threw one. Um, you know, that's that's proper decision making. That's going through your progressions, your offensive line giving you the time. You're not panicking and you're throwing and you're using all the, the God given gifts you got and you're leading your team down the field. And it culminated with that Raiders game. Think about it. With all the pressure of a game 50 years in the making. Frank O'Hara celebrating the Immaculate Reception. We lose our dear uh, teammate, uh, Frank O'Hara. So this run-up to this game, which, like I said, was 50 years in the making, there was pressure like you can't believe. And yet, it's one of two back-to-back -back games that Kenny leads a, a last-minute touchdown drive, 
in back-to-back minute games, throwing a touchdown pass in the last minute of the game. First time ever in NFL history a kid does that. And kudos to him. How could you have a bigger obstacle in front of you than than all that pressure with the Immaculate Reception, Celebration, Hall of Honor Museum, all these stuff going on with the Raiders there, and it's minus 10 degrees wind chill, and you got to lead this team down the field and and, and put this game away for the frozen faithful that are sitting up in the stands there. Mm -hmm. And the kid does it. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. Just awesome. And that's, to me, that's how legends are made. That's how legends are born. Moments like that. Absolutely. Where were you, Craig, when you found out about the news about your teammate, Franco Harris? I was uh, in my, my office. I was uh, at work. It was um, somewhere between 5.30 and 6 a.m. And somebody texted me and said, man, I'm really sorry to hear about Franco. And I, well, Franco, what? What? And then I found out because I hadn't been listening to the news. I was just preparing for the radio show that day that uh, Max and I do. And uh, it was devastating. Uh, we just had... Eight days earlier, he had just come to Giant Eagle Market District um, here in Pittsburgh. I do a Tuesday night show with um, uh, with Pat, Pat Fryermuth, you know, the tight end. And uh, he came in and sat down with Pat and I. So you got that Penn State connection. Pat's interviewing him, and we're having fun. He's my old teammate, and we're talking about things. And I always laugh because I always told Franco, you got me into the Hall of Fame. Because your Hall of Fame shot is you carrying the ball, and it's a flow 36. And guess what? If you look in the lower right-hand corner, that's my foot and my knee. (laughs) I'm in the Hall of Fame, baby. Craig, I don't want to take up too much more of your time while I've got you here. I do want to ask you, do you have favorite or favorites to win Super Bowl 57? Uh, Don't have any favorites. Um, Well, okay. The little kid in me that grew up in Orchard Park, New York, 2.4 miles from the Bills Stadium there, okay, is the little kid inside rooting for the Buff Bills. You know, they've had a tough run of it in some places, you know, in the past, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. Jim Kelly era and the the 0-4, the four falls of Buffalo and so forth. Mm -hmm. But um, you got to root. I I have to root for them. They are my growing up. Like I said, I I grew up just 2.4 miles from that stadium. So, I root for them. I uh, hope they can uh, get to the point where they can uh, have it out with the Chiefs and then get over the Super Bowl. I think it's going to be the 49ers, and I hope the Buffalo Bills in the Super Bowl. Yeah, we'll see. I think that's a wise prediction. I know a lot of people are pulling for the Bills, just considering, too, with what happened with DeMar Hamlin, too. Right. And we'll see if he ends up making an appearance during this weekend's game against the Bengals. It should be a great one. Can you imagine the juice flowing in that house if DeMar shows up and oh, yeah. tells his boys, hey, I'm here for you, man. Let's go. Let's go get it. I just find that absolutely, I don't know, That's a, that's a that could be a story waiting to be told. Yeah, I mean, in the final week of the season, too, Craig, when they returned the first kickoff back, it's like if this was a Hollywood script, you'd have to throw it out because it wouldn't be believable. And by the grace of God, he's still alive. And, you know, the medical personnel that was able to administer CPR as quickly as they did, it's its just remarkable. It is. It's an, it's an act of God to spare that young man's life. I'm so glad to see, you know, people didn't get offended about praying. They said, hey, you know what? You know, it, this is important. This is huge. And uh, I just love the fact that uh, the guys were around. They're praying for him. Um, his, his recovery is nothing short of a miracle. Uh, when you see what was going on out there. And, um, you know, hey, awesome. Just awesome. Glad to see that he's on the rebound so well. Craig, I want to thank you for your time. This has been fantastic. We're going to have to get you back on because I could talk to you till sundown about your experience in Steelers football. But thank you so much for joining the Believe in Steelers show here today. Well, thank you so very much for having me. And yeah, because I would love to go kibitz more with our, my, our man Ike there. Just yes. he's such a dynamic player in his period of time. I had such respect for his skills, such respect for the teammate that he was to all his other teammates because he was a man of accountability. He was a, a tough guy. And I, like I said, got a lot of respect for him. So thank he's, you for having me on. He says to say thank you as well. He sent me a text message. Uh, is his son Ivan, the next generation, look like the way I'm looking at it, Wolf. We got the next generation, Joey Porter Jr. out of Penn State, that oh, Penn yeah. State connection. 
Ivan Taylor's got a lot of offers on the table too. I'd love to see in the future, get that next bloodline of the black and gold. That's, that's how I'm looking at it. I like it. I like it a lot. That's dynamite. Thanks for having me. For Craig Wolfley, I'm Mark Bergen. And uh, thank you to Ike Taylor as well. Craig, thank you again so much. Take care. This has been the Believe in Steelers show. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch.